Good morning on this, where I am anyway, foggy Labor Day morning. I woke up this morning and um, the kids are off school and sort of was just headed that direction. And then they actually, the kids got swooped up by my son's father, <clears throat> excuse me, and went off to breakfast and I was alone in the house. And I, I don't usually really think about Labor Day or this piece, but somehow that just started um, kind of in the space of actually having space and quiet in my house this morning. It started like going in my mind, what is this? Um, I mean, there's many things we could talk about with Labor Day, but you know, what, what is this and what is this? Uh, is this like work of being alive? And anyway, I just wanted to jump on and be with all of you in the midst of um, this. And so anyway, if you can't hear me, just wave wildly. As always, I invite your comments. I invite your questions. I invite your shares about your own life. I'm going to share what this means to me uh, as directly as I can. And I would love to also hear what it means to you. So for me, there's a bit of a duality, but I have long been somewhat frustrated with the, I don't know, the marching chant as it were of like, you know, what's your purpose or what's your gift in the world or what am I here to do or, uh, there's a, there's kind of a, a cult of personality within the personal growth world. And this is not new. I mean, it might be new-ish, I don't know. Um, but I, it, you know, I experienced this even 15, coming up on 20 years ago, <laughs> uh, when I first, I mean, it's interesting for me to say when I first entered the personal growth scene, because I'd actually been living in a Buddhist monastery, which, Frankly, I would call personal growth like <laughs> 2.0 or, you know, <clears throat> it's 0, 0.0 and 3.0 at the same time. But I had never experienced like out in the world kind of the personal growth world until I moved to San Francisco in 1999. And I'm simultaneously, I mean, I'm, I'm it's just actually is not simultaneously, but I am wildly grateful to the people I met at that time and the things they introduced me to because it really did put me on a path and it opened up um, it's opened up it served me in my inquiry it served in deepening my inquiry that I had been on in this Buddhist monastery around what is this what is this relational realm? Because I had been so much in the realm of solo practice, but there was this question because it was also in community. What is this relational realm? So, you know, I studied with Marshall Rosenberg and I studied with David Data and I took various courses and I met with groups and, and really it served me on this path of what is, what is this relational thing? And Within that, I met a lot of people who were living quote unquote normal lives. They were computer programmers, they were um, wait staff, they were students, they were artists, they were uh, real estate brokers. And as they got involved in the world of personal growth, suddenly were like, I need to teach this. I think what, you know, so many people were impacted by pieces of work and they were like, oh, I should just do this. And I think again, actually, because my whole life is grounded in Zen practice and very specifically grounded within the realm of 
of, of, the, mon of the monastery and monastic living, that this question in some way didn't even make sense to me. Because in the monastery, we did the most menial things every fucking day. Like we just woke up and we sat and did nothing. And then we ate with intention. And then we did the work that it took just to make the place run. So you might be on cabin crew and you would spend your days making beds and cleaning lamps and making sure there was tissue in the cabins, you know, like a little, a new tissue box or that the match boxes had enough matches in them so people could light their kerosene lamps when they came home at night. Are these the deep, meaningful tasks of life? You know, are they saving people's lives? Are they teaching deep and meaningful things? I, I don't know. You know, you might work on kitchen crew like I did for <laughs> years. This was like my, my, I consider the Tassajara kitchen basically one of the greatest teachers of my lives. And I can't tell you how many gallons upon gallons of carrots I chopped or onions I chopped or lettuce I tore. And I know we all know this and we say this, right? We say this, we say that it's the attention you bring to something, it's not the work itself. But most of us don't live this. We still think our lives will be better when we can stop working in corporate and we can follow our life purpose. And what I believe is this, is that nothing will change until you live your life purpose where you are. Whatever your job is, whatever limitations you're living with right now, maybe you're a single mother and you have no time to live your life purpose, but you are, I mean, I could go on about that because there is no greater life purpose than to raise children. They are absolutely, I mean, this is, that, that's all there is. Those are your books. Those are your greatest teachings. Those are your students. You know, those are the, if your child goes on to change the world, I, as far as I'm concerned, my children, I hope that they're better than me. That's like my prayer every day. Like, may my children actually do better than me, be better than me, not in some perfectionistic way, but may I lay my life down so that they actually can rise above where I am. And frankly, that's my prayer as a teacher as well. I hope my students surpass me, as scary as that might be. But maybe you are, an I mean, this would be another story from my life, but maybe you're an administrative assistant working in downtown whatever, whatever. Maybe you are waiting tables. Maybe you are uh, a janitor. Maybe you're a book editor. Maybe you're a CEO. Maybe all these things that might seem great or they might seem like not your life's purpose. But that's where you are right now. So what are your deepest values? What are you actually here to put forth into the world? And can you do that literally as you chop vegetables? Can you do that as you put a plate in front of somebody, whether you're working at a fancy restaurant or a diner, right? If, if you're here actually to create more love in the world, frankly, a restaurant or a, um, a coffee shop, it, there's no better place to do that. I worked as a barista for um, all through high school and this little place in Carmel and I remember I terrified my parents because I said, I don't think I ever, what, like, why would I go to college? I can serve people right here. Like every morning I get to say good morning and I get to give people something that they want and I get to know their order before they tell me. Like I get to know people and then allow them to be seen. What bigger purpose is there? And my parents were like, nah, you have to go to college. <laughs> of course, I went to college and I left after a year and I lived in the monastery. So <laughs> who knows, right? Who knows what any of this is? But 
if your purpose is to awaken people, if your purpose is to love people, if your purpose is to evoke love from people, if your purpose is to create beauty, if your purpose is to uh, awaken people to beauty, it, whatever this is, you can do it anywhere. And that is what living your purpose actually means. So any part of you that is waiting until you're in the right place or the right job or you're doing the real thing or the real work of your life, stop that right now because right now you have the opportunity to offer your gifts, the deepest gifts. It does not matter what you're doing. It does not matter if your house is a mess and your children are screaming. It does not matter if your work is unpublished. It does not matter. Like it just doesn't matter. You can literally offer your purpose right now. So about, well, it was, it was around the same time, actually, that I was involved in this community that I came to San Francisco. I was working as an administrative assistant. And frankly, I was fucking thrilled. I'd been living in a monastery for three years and I'd worn nothing but robes and like ratty jeans. And I was like, oh, I get to put on, you know, like dress slacks and go to downtown San Francisco and like, you know, do this administrative assistant thing. And, you know, the, the sheen of it did wear off for me. And um, I came to this point where I had all these different um, responsibilities throughout the office. We had two floors on this, you know, it was a big, it was a company called LexisNexis, you know, it was international company and um and i had so many different responsibilities that nobody knew where i was supposed to be at any given moment and i could i was taking my lunch break and i was going and watching a movie almost every day i love the movies just fyi is a whole side note but i really believe that movies are the um they're like the sitting around the campfire and telling stories of our era and i actually think that it would be valuable to honor them as such that it'll change a relationship to movies but that's a side note neither here nor there but i could go at the time that it would take me to leave the office to like get to the movie theater to watch a whole movie get all the way back and I still could do all my work and nobody would know that I was gone. And <clears throat> as awesome as that was in some ways, I, it also hit this point where I was like, ah, like, what is the point? What is the point? I, I need to, you know, and I sort of felt this, like, I got to leave, you know, because this is not this, there's more to life than this. And I remember really pulling myself back and I was like, that might be true but not like this. I don't leave like this. And I, it was like, I, it was like, like a condensing of my energy in a way. And I made a decision to stay in that job until I could leave with integrity. So it's talking about like life purpose. What is your purpose? And you can do it wherever you are, but there's also, what are your values? You know, one of the pieces for that, and this has been true for me almost my whole life, is this sense of, I know, I'm very aware, I am the only one who has to live with me all the time. Other people, you know, my, my actions and how I live and what I do and what I say absolutely impact people, other people all the time. But I am the only one who has to live with me all the time. So I know how I live, whether anybody else does or not. And it, to me, it is of supreme importance that I live in a way that I can sleep well at night and that I will ultimately lay on my deathbed and take my last breath and be able to say I did the best I could. I guarantee I've made mistakes. 
And I guarantee I have not been perfect. And I guarantee I, I already I know there are things that I regret and things that I have forgiven myself for. And there's all these, you know, I can always do better. But at the end of my life, I want to be able to say I did the best I could. And my values may be different than your values, but integrity is one of them. And that is for me, not only I do what I say I will do, but it's like, is this in alignment with who I am? Can I look myself in the eyes? Can I look in the mirror and go, okay, yes, that was my best. Yes, I met life like as who I am. And that kind of work that I was doing where I could do a half-assed job and no one would even know, I couldn't look myself in the eyes anymore. Nobody else knew. I was getting great reviews from my bosses. You know, people loved me at the office, et cetera, et cetera. But I couldn't look myself in the eyes. And that was what was most important. And so I doubled down and I really, to me, I thought, so what? So what if I'm, you know, reconnecting people's phone lines as they move offices? And so what if what I'm doing is, you know, creating these guest passes for people to search on Lex the LexisNexis site? And so what if I'm, you know, what like I, this is the menial tasks. What I am really doing is making people's lives easier. Whether that's the LexisNexis clients or whether that's the sales staff that I support. I'm making people's lives easier. And how can I do that to the best of my ability? And that simultaneously meant like really getting in alignment with myself in the office and not doing a half-assed job, even if no one would know. And I also realized that if I could do my job in half the time, maybe I didn't need to be there half the time. <laughs> and I went and I asked, I said, I wanna go back to school. And I can do my job in half the time. I want to work half time. And I, these are the, this is when I will come into the office these days. And I went to City College of San Francisco and I studied art for two years. And I also did my job. So that is living your life purpose. It may not look exactly the same to you, but there is the capacity. I had the capacity to stay in a corporate job in downtown San Francisco, working as an administrative assistant and also live my purpose. All right, that's a big soapbox of mine. So I absolutely agree with what Jenna said, which is this work isn't glamorous, it isn't praised by society, it's quiet and tender work and we can do this. Some There are jobs that are praised by society, but we still think like, oh, this isn't uh, like spiritual work, like to be a CEO of blah, blah, blah company or, you know, um, but if we, we all, no matter who we are, we have the capacity to bring our deepest, deepest values to it. And I believe that is how we actually change the world. That is how we actually change the world. And the importance is not only for like our job or the people we serve, but you know, one of my mentors, Rich Litvin, talks about sex and cash theory. And I don't know actually where this idea came to for him, but he says we all have our big sexy projects that we're excited about. And, you know, it's like what we want. We want to publish a book of poems or we want to uh, lead workshops or we want to, you know, take people on spiritual journeys to India or like these are sexy projects, you know, especially for the people who are, watch my lives. <laughs> other people have other kinds of sexy projects. <laughs> um, and then we have cash projects and sometimes they're the same. And isn't that wonderful when they're the same? But I believe that our willingness to also give our love and our devotion and our, our attempt, the same kind of attention and intention that we would give to our sexy project, to our cash project, this is what makes our lives full and allows us to bloom 
to like be full is not like, meh, meh. now I'm just doing the thing that pays the bills so that I can, you know, do the really exciting, sexy thing that makes me come alive over here. Like be fucking alive over here and this one will take care of itself. I guarantee that. I literally will stake my life on that. Come alive over here and this one will take care of itself. And it is our willingness. I've told this story before, but you know, it was only two, maybe three years ago now, because I think I've been telling the story for a while, but it was three years ago when I was kind of relaunching my coaching and teaching career. And I was not making ends meet. And my coaching and teaching was not paying the bills. And I started watching another child about three afternoons a week while I had my own children. Because for me, living in alignment with my values meant that it was a truer, it was a truer choice to do childcare, which is not my life's purpose, <laughs> although I love children but to, to take care of another child and be with my family and also pay the fucking bills rather than have some pipe dream about like, well, if I just had more time to work on my business, if I just got one more client, then, you know, then I would be living my purpose. I would, that would have done no service to my children who were quite young at the time or to my family who might then need to, step in and help because I couldn't pay the bills. Like our, our willingness and our capacity also to hold that realm and to bring true joy and life to it and say, yes, this is my life too. This is not me on hold until I get that other client that will pay the bills. No, this is my life and it is gorgeous. It is gorgeous already. And I am here fully with it. And then when I am over here doing this thing that I believe fulfills some other purpose in the world that I was brought here for, I am also here for that. And in that way, they're not separate. So I have to speak a little bit to this other side. It's not a do, it's not a, they're not opposed to each other. But it's how these dualities live together, is that this is also not about avoiding your destiny, which may include something different than a nine to five or being someone's employee. What that looks like, I don't know. You know, but I know that I have students who are really part of their destiny is to be teachers or it is to be artists or it is there is there's part of their destiny and it also does the world no service it is a disservice to the world to deny that part of your destiny so it is a disservice to the world to pretend like you're only alive when you're fulfilling the sexy part of your destiny but it is also a disservice to the world to deny the part of your destiny that also might be scary, that might require that you get rejections from publishers, or that might, might, might require that you stand in front of people and say, this is what I believe, and have people, it might be equally scary to have people say, I don't believe that, I disagree, or to have people say, yes, I'll follow you anywhere, right? Those could be equally <laughs> scary. But that willingness to also follow that part of your destiny is part of this. This is what it means to live our life's purpose. It means to bring our full selves and our deepest teaching and the strength of our values and integrity, meaning the alignment of who we are to every step we take and every action we take and every time we speak, and the way that we hold our entire life, which is both, well, even the, I mean, this isn't true about all teachers, right? Some people like, um, I can't 
the the hugging woman, I can't think of her name, Amma, right? I mean, Amma has people who do everything else for her, but she's like the 0.0000000001% of the population on this planet. Most of us have to go grocery shopping and clean our houses and pay the bills and drive a car and, you know, all these things. So even if we're you know, fancy pants teachers and get to do the thing that we want to do most, the truth that's in our heart most of the time. You know, frankly, I am lucky that way. I am blessed. I am absolutely blessed that what I do to make money absolutely fulfills my heart. And I changed my kids' diapers for years. And I still wash my own, like clean my own toilet and I wash my own dishes and I drive my kids to school and I pay my bills and I go to back to school night. Now, can I do those things with the same heart and the same aliveness as when I sit on a stage in front of my students? That, that is what I believe is truly living my purpose. And that is what I wish for each and every one of you, that there is no, I'm living my life's purpose over here and this is the schlumping work of life. Life is life is life all the time, all the time. And I believe that it was me bringing that attitude to my job at LexisNexis that had so many people, I, I, I can't tell you how many of the salespeople like took me out to lunch and you know, all like there were just, when I finally did leave, when I was like, it is time for me to go, the love that I receive, I think came from the fact that they could feel that ultimately I actually offered, like, I can't even remember like what my, you know, what did I do? I did weird like things on the computer and I, you know, generated passcodes for their clients, blah, 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 blah. But I devoted myself to those activities as a way of devoting myself to those people that I was serving. And we can do that no matter what. I have a couple of notes here. So there's a quote in Zen Buddhism and some version of it is written on um, it's a instrument I guess it's it's a, it's a rectangle of wood called the Han and there's a wooden mallet and we use that to call people to the meditation hall and so it's always in brush calligraphy and in any any Zen temple at least yeah, um, in my tradition, which is Soto Zen. Any Zen temple you go to anywhere in the world on the Han will have some version of this quote, which I believe came from Dogen, although who knows where Dogen learned it from, right? <laughs> um, but he says, life and death are of supreme importance. Time swiftly passes and opportunity is lost. Let us strive to awaken, awaken. Take heed, do not squander your life. To me, that means, yes, absolutely, opportunities. Take the opportunities, seize the day, right? Carpe diem. But the side that I think gets less attention, sort of less sexy, is let us strive to awaken, awaken. Take heed, do not squander your life. That is this moment. Do not squander this moment. Do not step away from your life's purpose just because what you happen to be doing seems like a menial task. I worked on shop crew at the monastery at Tassajara for a, an entire practice period. We dug ditches, we moved rocks, we unclogged people's toilets. Like, let us strive to awaken, awaken. Take heed, do not squander your life. I believe that's what it means to live your true nature. Some people will tell you what your true nature is, that your true nature is love or your true nature is spirit or your true nature. 
I do not claim to know what your true nature is. I do believe that each one of you actually knows what it is. And you, every single one of you has the capacity to live in alignment with your true nature throughout your entire life, through your entire life. And again, I don't say this as a way of perfectionism, right? Like, oh, I gotta like practice all the time or, you know, eat the right food or never yell at my kids. I mean, we shouldn't yell at our kids, but we do, <laughs> we do. So it's not this rigid perfectionism. It's just every moment, every, every breath, this willingness to say like, okay, how do I give my gift now? How do I actually express the truth of who I am no matter what I'm doing or where I am, no matter the limitations of my being or my body or my mind or my karma or my history or the life that has been given to me. We all have fucking limitations, every single one of us, and they are exquisite. They actually give us our life. They give us our life because they give us the the structure, there are, there, are, there are things that I cannot do and there are things that you cannot do. And this isn't about limiting mentality or, you know, it, this, that's not it. It's just, it's just the willingness actually to say, this is my limitation. How do I live most beautifully inside it? When I taught yoga asana classes, there were a couple things. One is I taught pre and postnatal yoga and I, and I loved it, right? Because women who are taking prenatal yoga or who are doing postnatal yoga, generally speaking, acknowledge that they have some limitation in their body. And we go, Oh, how do we, how do we do yoga with that? What are the asanas that express the beauty of this pregnant body? And what are the asanas that support the expressing of the beauty of this postpartum body? And then later, I taught uh, a gentle yoga class at the YMCA. And occasionally I would sub for like the power yoga class. And I never, I just hated it, honestly. <laughs> I hated sort of the like, the pushing through and the, and the, and the, and probably more than that, what I saw was that everybody who came to power yoga wanted to practice as though they had no limitations. And I do not believe that is true for any of us. I am just about as able-bodied as they come. I mean, I can't, I, I might die if I tried to run a marathon tomorrow, but I have limitations. And when I go into my practice, my willingness to move with them is what I believe expresses the most beauty. And so when I taught gentle yoga, the people who came to gentle yoga, they came because they recognized their bodies had limitations and they wanted to move them anyway. They wanted to express them anyway. And I came to realize in some ways that one of my deeper jobs was actually to offer the space to show people that it was safe to be in their bodies such as they were. No matter what we did, how far we got into some you know, yoga class or through the series I wanted to do, I had a woman who had had a stroke and she couldn't raise her left hand higher than her head. Her other arm, she could raise but one, and I just, I fell in love with this woman because of the way that she came and she expressed her body fully, her body fully, not trying to express somebody else's body fully. That is not walking your own dharma. How do you express your own body fully? And how do you express your own life fully? not trying to be outside of your life or live somebody else's, or if only I didn't have children, or if I'd been born into money, or if I lived in a different country, like, I don't know why we get born into the lives we do. I don't know, but we do. And what we get to do is express fully within them. And inside of that, we change the world. 
Inside of that, we change the world. So, the last two things I want to say, thank you for the hearts. I love hearts. <laughs> they make me want to cry. <laughs> the last two things I want to say is one, oh, I think I just heard my children come home, right? So how do I, what am I going to do inside the limitations of my life? <laughs> We'll see if they come rushing through the door. One is this is why I believe, and maybe I'll do a whole separate video on this because it's, I think this is huge, but this is why I believe that the idea of playing small is bullshit. At least in the way that it is generally talked about, there is no small life except not living the one that you're given. So find what are those true values and what is it that you're here to give and then give it no matter what and there is no playing small. The other is that something that Yogi Bhajan said over and over, he said that we're here to be a forklift for others in the world. Like those, um, like in Costco, right? You know, there's those little things that go through deep, deep, deep through the store and then they, they have those two little forks, they fork under and they lift things up. And that is what we are here to do and to be, is to be a forklift. We are not here to flagellate people into doing better. We are not here to say, this is the better life and this is the worse life. We're not here to say you're doing it wrong. We're here to do whatever it takes to lift people up. So in your life, such as it is, are you lifting? Are you lifting? And are you doing what you need to do so that you can lift others? Are you lifting yourself enough so that you can lift others and literally make your life a forklift? Thank you. I'm gonna take a moment here to look at the comments and then I'm pretty sure I need to go downstairs before my children get into too much mischief. Oh. Joseph said, this reminds me of a beautiful quote. Looks like it's from David Data. A life well lived is a life wherein your gifts are given fully, no holding back, even if you are not appreciated, acknowledged, or noticed for the giving. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's so good. I actually had this other quote I wanted to read, which is, comes from Rumi. It says, there are love dogs no one knows the names of. Give your life to be one of them. There are love dogs no one knows the name of. Give your life to be one of them. I will say, again, there's this dynamic tension, which is also be willing to be seen. If you're going after not being seen or being seen, then your attention is on yourself. If you give your gift in that way and you take your attention off yourself, whether you're seen or not seen, then your life will be expressed. And I actually believe that the blessings will come to you. The blessings will come to you. But you have to allow yourself to potentially not be seen and acknowledged and also potentially be seen, which can be just as challenging. So allow for both. Hi, Andy. Andy said, inspiration exists, but it has to find you working. Pablo Picasso. That's beautiful. <laughs> there's a, there's another one about, uh, I can't remember. 
but about inspiration, right? So there is, there is this piece that comes from the tending of the soil, right? And that's then the inspiration can come, the seed can come. Uh, so Andy said, I believe this is what I hear you saying. Do what is in front of you with all you have in presence. Absolutely. Absolutely. So beautiful to see all your faces as I go. Oh, Helen, I'm so glad. I'm so glad this was supportive. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, Lori. I don't know what Lori is laughing about, but Lori, I know, Lori Sanaki, I know from when I was a young, young child in the monastery. So um, it's beautiful that you at least stopped in and maybe I said something funny. <laughs> um, oh, Dana, I'm so glad that this was uh, helpful and supportive to you. Aaron said, there is no small life except not living the one you have been given. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad you were here. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mostly there were all these comments of, of praise, which uh, does feel very good. <laughs> um, yeah. So on this Labor Day, yeah, what is the labor of love? What is the labor of love that you would do if no one ever knew you did it? And what is the labor of love that you're willing to do even if the whole world was watching? Do that. I love you. <laughs>